the foreword uh, to the book and the questions were very relevant so i could only take uh, probably the uh, i will try to take 10 or 11 questions the rest will go in the other volumes and it is so difficult to put everything in details and not for any philosophical reasons but for explanations it is very important that you put it very clearly and that's why it has taken a long a number of pages there was one question that anand had uh, asked that was in the original list buddhism went to china with bodhi dharma and flowered in present one of the most beautiful flowers islam came to india and sufism sikhism and kabir panth flowered as the epitome of devotion why are there not so many experiments in religious synthesis since these have produced remarkable fusions so when it is coming to speak on it has to be seen many things so this is what i was trying to finish now when we look at the charles darwin's theory he says that their man came out of the evolutionary process the monkeys started walking and man came into existence he was orthodox christian so all of a sudden monkeys started walking and man uh, it became man and it, the bible says god created man in his image so what did he do and now the darwinian theory is very much in contradiction and it has been rejected by many this is how you have to bring out everything in details and that takes the time when you are answering the question first of all you do not deviate from your theme that you are bringing out a clear insight is not a philosophical answer so that the people understand the futility of it there was a person alister hardy a english man he was given an award because he was working on a uh, theory of evolution and he had miserably failed in doing so why is there need for synthesis mahatma gandhi tried to create synthesis but he utterly failed in that and that is just a mockery in the name of synthesis his he is basically a hindu and to him the ultimate message of god is condensed in bhagavad gita no other scripture is as profound according to gandhi as is bhagavad gita so he chooses few verses from the holy quran that resonate with bhagavad gita then he chooses a few verses a few passages from the holy bible only those pieces that resonate with bhagavad gita he chooses from tau te ching he chooses from dhampad he chooses from kalmu those passages which resonate according to his understanding with bhagavad gita and that is the religious synthesis it is like this you are taking a part you are going to create a unique vehicle so you take a steering of mercedes benz the body of ford and the wheels of 
some other vehicle and you call it a vehicle a synthesis it is not synthesis and who knows whether that mechanism will work or not why not accept everything as it is science is as beautiful as anything else the most beautiful thing is this to attain to uniqueness uniqueness when you attain to your totality when dancing the dancer disappears there simply remains a dance this is a beauty when the painter disappears although some someone will be painting on the canvas with the brush and paints but in fact the painter is lost in the painting the individual his ego is no more there that is a beauty when a meditator is in meditation he has forgotten everything and just meditation remains the oneness remains this uniqueness is important not the synthesis that you are why are you trying to bring the synthesis and one of the statements of gandhi which has been used by swami chinmayanand as an important quotation on bhagavad gita by gandhi ji this is a mock he says that whenever problems stare at me i look at words here and there in bhagavad gita and i find solace and that solace i have not found in the sermon on the mount or any verse in any passage from quran what kind of synthesis is this if synthesis means everything has merged into one another and there is harmony there is blending you look at the tea you are making tea there are five different elements that constitute tea you take water you take sugar you take milk you take the tea leaves if these are put together in the absence of fire in the absence of heat they will not blend into one another it is like oil and water never mixing up with one another and the moment all these things are put together on the fire and the fire is lit what happens the water loses its individuality its nature sugar loses you cannot find the sugar after it has dissolved into the tea you cannot find the tea leaf in its original form once it has blended into water you cannot find milk out of tea once the tea has formed all these different elements have merged into one another and lost their significance and something new beneficial something new a different taste evolves this is synthesis when all the rivers the water of all the rivers be it hudson be it thames be it nile be it amazon be it ganges or any other river it merges into a pool of water we call it ocean we do not call it by the accumulated water of all the rivers we call it by the name of ocean which is the harmony which is unique in its character this is how it has to be explained you look at the the christian priest some day he hopes to become a bishop and then when he is bishop he hopes to be a cardinal and then he hopes to be a pope this is a simply a hierarchy and it is acceptable there is no objection to it was adinath the first master of jain religion who created a godless religion he said man is most important man can evolve 
there is nothing that can be evolved in God. And 5,000 years ago he gave this rent, but it remained as a religion of ascetics and many other things. Then 2,500 years after Buddha gave the religion of meditation, but that too got lost when Buddha was no more there, the priesthood came into it. The organized religions came into existence. Now you have to have faith in Buddha. You have to follow the principles of Buddha. This is what all the different monks the people who are propagating Buddhism, this is what Buddhism is. You have faith in Buddha, to follow the principles of Buddha, to live life according to his doctrine. Thus Buddha too got lost in the organization and imitation. But they all forgot the basic things that Buddha propounded was meditation. So first we developed, Adinath developed 5000 years ago, the godless religion. And Buddha made religion the very essence, Buddha made meditation the very essence of the religions. We have seen what happened to the religions which have God as the center. All the religions, the religions that evolved out of Judaism, the Islam, the Christianity, all of them are, uh, and Hinduism, in all these religions, God is the center. We have seen what happened to Adinath's revolutionary concept, the godless religion. We have seen what happened to Buddha, organized religion without God. Just as they dissolve God, now it is time to dissolve the religion too, so that there is a religionless religion. There is no need to worry about anything. Is it not enough that you are a human? Is it not enough that you are meditating? Leave only meditation so it cannot be forgotten anything. There is nothing else to replace. There is no God and there is no need for religion. By religion I mean an organized doctrine, creed, ritual, priest. And for the first time I want religion to be absolutely individual. Because all organized religions, whether with God or without God, have misled humanity. And the sole cause has been organization because organization has its own way, which go against the meditative views. Organization is really a political phenomenon. It is not religious. It is another way for power and will to power. Look at Christianity. The priest hopes to become bishop at least to become cardinal and to become pope. This is new hierarchy, a new bureaucracy. And because it is a spiritual, nobody objects. You may be a bishop, you may be a pope, and you may be anything. It is not objectionable at all. My effort is to have a religion which does not require peace. It remained with God, it remained with godless religion. Now the only way is that we should dispose of God and religion both, so that there is no possibility of any peace. Then man is absolutely free and totally responsible for his own good. With priesthood man is not responsible enough for his own good. My feeling is that the more a man is responsible for his own growth, the more difficult it would be for it to postpone for long. 
If you are responsible for your progress in your work, can you remain idly by? Can you forget the day and night you have to strive for your growth and sustenance? But such is not the case with religion. We go on postponing until we have no more energy left. And when you look at the churches, the temples, the mosques, what kind of age group is there? Mostly the older people go to the churches because they do not have anything to lean on to. So they just hold on to the organized religion as a staff in their hand, as a raft in their hand. Because then if you are responsible for your own growth, the more difficult it will be for you to postpone it for long because it means you are miserable. If you are miserable, you are responsible for it. But your organized religion tells you that your misery is not because of you. You are a religious person, very devoted. The misery is because of the society, because of the people, because of your neighbors, because of your spouse, because of all these superfluous things. And nowhere the responsibility comes on you that you are miserable because of your own doings. No one else is responsible. If you are suffering, you are the cause of it. There is no God, there is no priesthood and there is nowhere to go and ask for the rituals. The moment you feel miserable, what you do, you run to the priest, ask for the solution. If you are left alone with your misery, then one day you will find the solution to your misery. Because you are mature enough. Only then the humanity can be mature enough. The priest goes on giving you the intoxication, the opium. They go on giving you hope. Don't be worried. It is a just a test of your faith, of your trust. And if you can pass through this misery and suffering silently and patiently, in the other world, beyond death, you will be immensely rewarded. During this period of Muslim period of fasting, there are many songs which says, which gives a hope that those who fast during the month of the fasting, they make their home in the heaven. What is the proof whether you get a house, home made in heaven or not? And no one has ever come back from heaven to say that, yes, I have gotten the home. People come back from America, from England, that they have bought a house in England or they have got an award, but no one has come back from the heaven to say that I was awarded a house in heaven. But the religion keeps on doing that. That is why the society, that is why the man is miserable. That is why there is no peace. That is why there is no harmony. Priests go on giving you hope you. They go on giving you hope, don't be worried. It is just a test of your faith, of your trust. If you pass through this misery and suffering, silently and patiently, the other world beyond that will be immensely rewarded. If there is no priest, you have to understand that whatever you are, you are responsible for it. Nobody else. The moment this comes to you, that I am responsible for my state of affairs, I am responsible for my misery, I am responsible for my lack of harmony, then there is a possibility of growth. Then one day, the first step is to accept your state of affairs as your own responsibility. The door opens. Then you start looking for method and means to get out of this miserable state. And that is what meditation is. 
It is simply the opposite state of misery, suffering, anguish and anxiety. It is a state of peaceful, blissful flowering of the being, so silent and so timeless that you cannot conceive that anything better is possible. And there is nothing which is better than the taste of the meditative mind. And there is nothing which is better than the taste of a meditative mind. This should be used as a quote in your office, in your home. There is nothing better than the state of a meditative mind. A meditative mind is silent, peaceful and blissful. So you can say that there are three quantum leaps. Adinath drops God because he finds God is becoming too heavy on man. Rather than helping him in his growth, he has become a burden. But he forgets to replace him with something else. Man will need something in his miserable moments. In his sufferings, he used to pray to God. You have taken God away. You have taken his prayers away. And now when he will be miserable, what will he do? In Jainism, meditation has no place. It is Buddha's insight to see that cause has been dropped. Now gap should be filled. There is a gap voidly. When God has been dropped, then what else to do? Something has to be replaced in this place. Otherwise, this gap will destroy the man. He puts in meditation. Something really authentic, which can change the whole being. But he was not aware, perhaps he could not be aware because there are things you cannot be aware of unless that happens. That there should be no organization, that there should be no priesthood, that as God is gone, religion should also be gone. But he cannot be forgiven because he had not thought about it. And there is no past to help him to see. It came after him. The real problem is the priest. The God is the invention of the priest. Unless you drop priest, you can drop God. But as long as the priest is there, a new prop comes up. You have to drop the priest. But the priest will always find new rituals. He will create new gods. Drop the priest, which is most relevant. My effort is to leave you alone with meditation. No priest, no way to go. This is what has been the message of Lalaji. The most important and significant thing was meditation. In my 15 years of my stay or more with Sufi Omkarna and Shafantla Devi, we were never forced to go to a temple. We were never forced to go to any of those organizations. The most important thing was morning meditation, evening meditation, the congregation, the individual meditation. Every night you are supposed to have the meditation. And the other day when I was speaking to my uh, small uncle, he told me that uh, the uh, probably you are doing it, you have your individual meditations in the night. Not that on a specific day, that you have chosen a specific day for meditation. Not that you have chosen a specific time, but the specific time is important in the sense so that it can create an insatiable quest in you to meditate. Every night, while you are working, the meditation becomes your client. Meditation becomes your essence. But then in the night, before you are going to sleep, again you enter into meditation. 
Sufi Brij Mohan Lal every night he meditated before going to sleep and then from 3 o'clock onwards he will again have his meditation because it is important for you and through that you are sending the vibrations to millions of the people as long as you are alive. My effort is to leave you alone with meditation, with no meditate, no mediator between you and the existence. When you are not in meditation, you are separated from existence. And that is your suffering. You are suffering because you are separated from the world. When the, the uh, Rumi says, when the reed is removed from the reed bed, the song of the reed is the lament of separation from its reed's bed, reed bed. Your misery is because you are discontinuous with the existence. Your misery is not because of the other, as has been propagated by the organized religions. When you are not in meditation, you are separated from the existence. And that is your suffering. It is the same as when you take the fish out of the ocean and throw it on the bank. Your misery is because you have been taken out of the ocean of the existence. And meditation is the water in the ocean of the existence. Just as fish lives in water, breathes, and water is, is the very life, the very life force, the very essence of the fish. So too meditation is the very essence of your life, very essence of your being. It is the same as you, as when you take a fish out of the ocean and throw it on the bank, the misery and the suffering and the tortures the fish goes through, the hankry and the effort to reach back to the ocean because it is there the fish belongs to. He is the part of the ocean and he cannot remain separate from the ocean. And his suffering is simply indicative that you are not in communion with existence. That fish is not in the ocean. Make this an important statement as the quotation. The suffering, the suffering is simply indicative that you are not in communion with existence. Meditation is nothing else but betraying all the values, thoughts, emotions, sentiments that create a war between you and the existence. That creates a China wall between you and the existence. The moment they drop, you suddenly find yourself in tune with the whole. Not only in tune, you really find that you are whole. When a dew drop slips from a lotus leaf into the ocean, it does not find that it is part of the ocean. It finds it is ocean. The dewdrop slipping from the lotus leaf does not find that it is part of ocean now. Instead it finds that it is ocean. And to find it is the ultimate goal, the ultimate realization, there is nothing beyond this. So Adinath dropped God, but he did not drop organization. And because there was no God, the organization created rituals. Buddha seeing what had happened to Jainism, 
that it has become a ritualism dropped god even he dropped all rituals and single pointedly insisted on meditation but now you look at the buddhism there are rituals it has to be done this way that way buddha never chanted any mantras buddha sharanam gachami this was not a mantra this was the song when the monks are traveling to reach to the buddhas they continue as a remembrance so that they do not forget along the way he dropped all rituals and single pointedly insisted on meditation but he forgot that the priests who had made ritualism rituals in buddhism in jainism are going to do the same with meditation they are making meditation as ritual now buddhism has made meditation as the rituals the buddhist monks and they did it they made buddha himself a god they talk about meditation but basically buddhists are worshippers of buddha they go to the temple and instead of krishna or christ there is buddha's statues relics and things like this there was no statue of buddha for 5000 years after buddha in buddhist temples they had just the tree under which buddha became enlightened engraved on marble just a symbol of buddha was not there only the tree you will be surprised that the statue of buddha that we see today has no resemblance to buddha it resembles the personality of alexander the great Alexander the Great came to India 300 years after Buddha. Till then there was no statue of Buddha. The priests were in search because there was no photograph. There was no painting. So how to make the statue of Buddha? And Alexander's face looked really a superhuman face. It had a beautiful personality a green face and physiology they picked up the idea of buddha's face and body from alexander so all these statues that are being worshiped in the buddhist temples are the statues of alexander they have nothing to do with buddha but the priests had to create had to create these statues god was not there ritual was difficult around meditation ritual was difficult you don't need any sculpture you don't need any statue for meditation wherever you are you don't need any specific place even in the beginning it may be necessary but not later on then just you and you alone and that is enough criteria for meditation to have just you and you alone is the enough criteria for meditation meditation is not going outward but going within for going within do you need the torch light do you need the light do you need anything else nothing else is needed so all the statues that are being worshiped in the buddhist temples are the statues of alexander they have nothing to do with buddha but the priests had to create this statue god was not there ritual was difficult around meditation indeed ritual becomes difficult they created a statue and they started saying in the same way all religions have been doing have faith in buddha 
have a trust in you and you will be saved. Both the revolutions were lost. And this is what has been happening. No prayer, no priest. You alone are enough to face the sunrise. You don't need anybody to interpret for you what a beautiful sunrise is. It is said that every morning Lao Tse used to walk in the hills. One friend asked him, can I come with you one day? I would particularly like, particularly like to come tomorrow because I have a guest who is very much interested in you and he will be immensely glad to have the opportunity to be with you for two hours in the mountains. Lao Tzu said, I have no objection, just one thing. It has to be remembered, I do not want anything to be said because I have my eyes. When you are going somewhere, you are going with your friend, husband, wife, children or anybody else and it is sunrise. They consider you blind and say, look, look, what a beautiful sunrise is there, beautiful flower. You think I am blind? I do not have the eyes to see. I do not have the eyes to see the sunrise or the blossoming of a beautiful flower. So Lao Tse said, I have no objection, just one thing has to be remembered. I do not want anything to be said because I have my eyes. You have your eyes. He has his eyes. We can see. There is no need to say anything. And the friend agreed. But on the way when sun started rising, the guest forgot. It was so beautiful by the side of the lake. The reflection of the, the reflection of all the colors, the birds singing, and the lotus blossom opening, he could not resist and he forgot. He said, What a beautiful sunrise. His host was shocked because he has broken the condition. Lao Tse did not say anything. Nothing was said there. Back home he called his friend and told him, do not bring your guest again. He is too talkative. Just only one sentence he said, what a beautiful sunrise. The sunrise was there. I was there. He was there. You were there. What is the need to say anything, any comment, any interpretation? Does he think that I was blind? And that is the attitude of the master. You are here. Every individual is here. The whole existence is available to you. The sunrise, the sunset, the beautiful starry night, the blossoming of the flowers, the river flowing down the stream, the roaring of the ocean, the chirping of the birds, everything is there. All that you need is just to be silent and listen to the existence whispering you. Just the existence whispering to you through the raindrops, through the water flowing down the stream, through the cry of a child, through the ray of sunlight, the existence is talking to you in a myriad ways. This is whispers of a gun. The moment you are capable of listening to the whispers of the unknown, there is no need for any religion. There is no need for any God. There is no need for any priesthood. 
There is no need for any organization. Just you and you alone is enough. For us, during the time, the celebration of the festivals was a celebration of joy. The only religious significance was that of meditation. The only sacredness was meditation. Even on the days of the festival of light and the festival of colors, our emphasis was on meditation. The other things are social. We never did any rituals that are normally done on those days. Simply meditation and meditation. From time to time there would have been talks because they are part of it, but not a ritual. I trust in the individual categorical. No one has trusted the individual the way I have done it. You are capable of creating an oasis within you. You are capable of Buddha. You can create your own Buddha within you. You can create your own harmony within you. You are capable of doing that. I trust individual, I trust you as an individual categorical. No one up to now has trusted the individual in such a profound way. There is no need for synthesis. Let there be uniqueness. The day is unique in its own way. Existence does not seek synthesis. That day and night has to be synthesized. Day is day. The sunlight is as beautiful as moonlight. The starry night is as beautiful as the dark night. Enjoy the beauty of each and every. Cherish it and be enriched by this beauty of the sunrise, the beauty of the sunset, the beauty of the dark night, beauty of the sun, uh, the starry night. When it is dark, you see a different kind of a glow when you come out under the starry night, in the night. There is darkness, but this darkness is of a totally different texture. It is not the darkness which is inside, but it has a glow in it. A very pleasantness. Observe that. The beauty of that dark night. This is the beauty. It is better to be open to all beauties, all uniqueness. And when you are open to all beauties and uniqueness of the entire existence of every creature that you come across, Every occasion, every creature that you come across on a day-to-day -day basis, in your workplace, on the road as a commuter, or anywhere else, the moment you cherish the uniqueness of the person, the uniqueness of the occasion, you are enriched. 
and that enrichment is the essential core of your being. Only this much for this afternoon. I just shared a few pages from this. The goose was never in 